As we read the Bible, beginning in the Old Testament, we find a theme that is repeated over and over again throughout each book. A promise that someday, according to the plan of God, there will be one who will come forth from the glory of heaven, one who will take back the earth from the enemy of our souls, and who will release us from the bondage of our sin, bondage that we have been under ever since the fall in the Garden of Eden. The hope of a Savior. A Savior who will release us from an eternity of separation from God because of our rebellion against him. A king who will rule and who will reign in his eternal kingdom forever. And in John chapter 18, as Jesus stood before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, he asked Jesus if he was a king. After all, Jesus certainly did not look like a king. He had no army. He had no land. He had no wealth. He had no kingdom. But Jesus answered him and said to him, You say correctly, I am a king. And for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who hears my voice is of the truth. The king had come forth into the world to proclaim the truth of the gospel of the kingdom of God, that those who believe, he said, those who know me, they will know me, and if they know me, they will follow me in obedience to my word. So Jesus testified that he was the long-awaited king, the Messiah, who was spoken of in the Old Testament, the Christ of God. And as we read through the Old Testament, we find that Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies concerning the Messiah. Over 300 prophecies concerning the King. And in Matthew chapter 13, Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has chosen to focus our attention on four of those prophecies. And we have already considered the first prophecy, haven't we? As he brought to our attention in verses 5 and 6, a prophecy from the Old Testament, from the prophet Micah, who wrote hundreds of years before Jesus was born, and who said that the king, the Messiah, would be born in the village of Bethlehem, in the province of Judah, a king who would rule and who would shepherd his people Israel with justice and with righteousness forever. And Matthew reminds his readers that some months after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, magi, wise men, came from the east, from Mesopotamia, not kings, but king makers, as they were known, men who appointed kings in their nation. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, what did they do? We are told that they began to ask everyone this one question. 
where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we've come to worship him. The prophecy that is found in the book of Micah had been fulfilled. The king had arrived on this earth, and these wise men testified to his arrival, to the fulfillment of the words of Micah. And when they found him in Bethlehem, we are told that they fell down on their knees, and they fell at his feet, and they worshipped him, and presented gifts to the king. What an encouragement. What an encouragement to Joseph. What an encouragement to Mary, confirming the words that the angel had given to them, confirming the words of Zacharias and of Elizabeth, confirming the words of the shepherds, confirming the words of Simeon and Anna. What a time of joy. But very quickly, their joy was mixed with concern and even with fear. Because it says, now, verse 13, now, when the wise men had departed and returned to their home in the east, behold, Matthew remarks, take note of this urgent warning from heaven. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying to him, Arise, Egero in Greek. It's an urgent appeal. Quickly get up on your feet and take the child, take his mother, and flee. If you go, run away. Because there is an imminent threat that is about to come down upon this child. But you can escape this threat, the angel says, by going to Egypt. All the way to Egypt. Well, at this point in the history, Egypt had become a safe haven for many people from the nation of Israel, primarily in the city of Alexandria, which had become a sanctuary for them. And we are told that as many as a million Jews lived in that region, in Egypt. So, the angel said to Joseph, remain there in Egypt until I tell you, for King Herod is going to diligently search for the child in an attempt to destroy him. But by seeking to kill Jesus, Herod unknowingly testified that he believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the rightful king of the Jews, who was a threat to his throne. And so we're told Joseph arose and he took the child, and he took his mother secretly by night, so no one would know. And they departed from Bethlehem and they went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod, Teliute, until his life was over, which may have been only a few months from this time. But surely, surely you say, the Lord could have protected the child and his family in some other way, couldn't he have? Instead of dragging them all the way down to Egypt, 175 miles away? After all, he is God. We may ask the same question sometimes when the Lord allows things in our lives. And we would be right. As we're reminded in Psalm 115, where it says, Our God 
is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. Well, couldn't he have protected them where they were? Well, the answer, of course, is he, he could have. But the Lord had another purpose. He had another plan for Jesus going down to Egypt as he has a plan for each one of us. Now, in the case of Jesus, it was to fulfill a prophecy. A prophecy that is found in the Old Testament. A prophecy concerning the Messiah. A prophecy concerning the King. An unusual prophecy, you might say, because this is a picture of the Christ. A picture of the Son that is found in the nation of Israel. A nation that God called his son. And you will recall that Jacob took his family down to Egypt. Why? To escape a famine, right? Just as the Lord told Joseph to take Jesus down to Egypt to escape death. But in addition to that, Matthew tells us, the Lord had Joseph take this child to Egypt so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Hosea might be fulfilled. Where he said in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, these words that are recorded here in verse 15. Out of Egypt did I call my son. But when the prophet Hosea spoke those words 700 years before the birth of Jesus, how did he understand those words? He understood them to refer to the nation of Israel and how God had delivered his people, his son, from their bondage in Egypt. So then why did Matthew interpret this Old Testament verse as a prophecy of a future event in addition to a historical event. It is because God saw Israel as his child. He saw Israel as his son, the one whom he loved with a great and with an everlasting love, so he would never abandon his people. He would not abandon his son in Egypt. A picture that illustrates this one point. God the Father would not abandon God the Son in Egypt. And just as the Lord had brought the nation of Israel out of bondage, out of the land of Egypt, and into the promised land, so he would bring Jesus out of Egypt and into the land of Israel. So Matthew tells us, Bethlehem and even Egypt are two locations that speak of the Messiah. They speak of the fact that Jesus is the one who is pictured in the Old Testament. And then we're told, verse 16, when Herod saw that he had been tricked, empaizo in Greek, when he had been deceived by the Magi, when they were warned by an angel in a dream, that Herod had evil intentions toward this child. When this was brought to their attention, what did they do? We're told they returned to their own country without telling Herod of the location of the child, of the king, of the Jews. And when they avoided returning to him, what was his reaction? We're told in verse 16, he became very enraged. Thumo in Greek. He was full of wrath. He was out of control. He was in a blind 
rage, almost as if he was insane. And so, while Jesus and Joseph and Mary were in Egypt, he sent soldiers and they slew all of the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all of its environs, Horion, in the entire surrounding area. And even though Jesus was probably no more than six months old at this point, Herod had his soldiers slaughter the male children from two years old and under, according to the time which he had ascertained from the Magi when they first came to him looking for the location of this newborn king. A precaution in his twisted mind so that the child, the true king of the Jews, would not escape his wrath. He foolishly set himself up against the anointed of God foolish people are to set themselves up against God. And those innocent babies were the first casualties in the war between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, a war which still rages today. Ah, oh, but Matthew sees another fulfillment of prophecy even in the death of these children when he says this in verse 17, that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah 31 verse 15 was fulfilled in this event, in this death of these precious children, where it records these words saying, a voice was heard in Ramah, Weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children. And she refused to be comforted because they were no more. They were dead. But the village of Ramah was six miles north of Jerusalem. While Bethlehem was six miles south of Jerusalem. So how does this fulfill a prophecy? Well, the village of Ramah was located along the border of the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And it was the place where the captives from the nation of Israel of Judah were assembled for deportation to Babylon in the year 586 BC. So Ramah was a place where the mothers mourned for their children because they would never see them again. It was a place of great mourning. And who who was Rachel? Well, we know she was the wife of Jacob, who later had his name changed to Israel. So Rachel represents all of the mothers in Israel who are weeping for their children. The mothers in Bethlehem who are weeping for their children. But this sorrow, we're told by Matthew, this sorrow will be turned into joy, he says in verse 19, for when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared once again in a dream to Joseph while they were in Egypt, saying to him, verse 20, arise. Get up on your feet and take the child and take his mother. Take them out of Egypt and go into the land of Israel. 
For those who have sought the child's life are dead. Stop weeping. The Messiah will return, bringing salvation with him. And so we're told Joseph arose and he took the child and he took his mother and they once again came into the land of Israel. But the threat was not over because Joseph heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in, in place of his father, Herod the Great. And Archelaus was almost as bad as his father. At the Passover feast in Jerusalem, he had just slaughtered 3,000 Jewish worshipers. And so Joseph was afraid, we're told. He was afraid to go into that land. And the Lord confirmed his fears, we're told, because Joseph was warned of this danger by God in a dream. And so what did he do? We're told he departed for the regions of Galilee, north, where another son of Herod was reigning, Herod Antipas, but he was not as wicked as Archelaus. And so we're told when they came to that place, they resided in the city, in the village really, of Nazareth, their hometown, about 60 miles or so north of Jerusalem. But Matthew sees this as another fulfillment of prophecy. And he says in verse 23, they lived there not because it was their hometown, but they lived there so that what was spoken of through the prophets might be fulfilled, where they said, he shall be called a Nazarene. But there's one problem. These words may have been spoken through the prophets but they were never written down or recorded in the Old Testament scriptures. So, where's Matthew coming from? Well, perhaps he sees another fulfillment of prophecy in a different way. At the time Matthew wrote these words, wrote this account, to be called a Nazarene, was an insult. We recall in John 1.46, the question was asked, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And the answer seemed to be no. To be called a Nazarene, no matter where you were from, was a name of reproach. It was a name of disrespect and even of hatred. And the scriptures do testify that the Messiah would be despised, that he would be rejected, as it says in Psalm 22, that he would be a reproach to men, despised by the people, as it says in Isaiah 53, he was despised and forsaken of men, a, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, like one from whom we hid our face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. As he said himself in Psalm 69, reproach has broken my heart. I am so sick. I looked for sympathy. And there was none. I looked for comforters, but I found none. Jesus was a Nazarene. He was the very picture of the fulfillment of the scriptures. He 
was a king who came forth from Egypt only to be rejected, only to die. He came forth out of Egypt to be our Savior. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Berean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.